Tonight we're going to share with you on the subject of the present ministry of Jesus Christ. We have talked about the redemptive work of Jesus, and it's important that we understand the present ministry of Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 1, we see it says, God at sundry times and diverse manners spake in time past in the fathers by the prophets. That was in the Old Testament era. Hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself, by Jesus himself, purged our sins, paying the price for them, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus is still seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, at the right hand of the Father. And it goes on and says, Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. The word begotten means born. Because after Jesus had paid the price in hell for three days and three nights, he was born from the dead, the firstborn from the dead. And he said, and again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. As he was born again from the dead, came back into sonship with the father. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, this is when Jesus came up out of hell after being there for three days and three nights. The word first begotten means the firstborn. Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. You and I get born again, and we become a new creation when we receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, and we get a brand new spirit on the inside of us. He said, let all the angels of God worship him. And he comes down to verse 8, and it declares Jesus' inauguration as the King of kings and the Lord of lords when he's enthroned in heaven after he went back to heaven. He says in verse 8, under the Son, this is the Father speaking, to the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. He's enthroned as the King of kings, the Lord of lords. A scepter of righteousness. A scepter is a rod, of, a symbol of authority. It means a rod, a symbol of authority. He begins to rule, and it's according to righteousness is the way he rules. And he enters into his kingdom and begins to rule and reign. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, and He is ruling and reigning. We see in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1, Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest that is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Jesus is now a high priest. He is the high priest over the new covenant. And it says He's a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle. See the one that they made here with the Old Testament era was simply a replica or a type of what was in heaven. The real one, the true one, is in heaven, the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Every high priest ordained to offer gifts and sacrifice, wherefore it is of necessity this man have someone also to offer. If we were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of the heavenly things, which is what the Old Testament was, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed thee in the mount. Just simply a replica of what was up in heaven. Now he's obtained a more excellent ministry. Now he's in the true tabernacle. By how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant that was established upon better promises. Now we have a better covenant the New Testament. Jesus made the New Testament between the Father and Himself. This is a better covenant. And when it says established, this word established means enacting laws, enacting laws or laws that have been enacted upon better promises. Because there are laws of the New Testament that you and I follow after in order to see the better promises come to pass in our life. Now how did Jesus become a high priest? In Hebrews chapter 5, you see over in verse 5, it says, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest. He didn't just try to make himself one a high priest himself. But he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee, which means to be born. 
That's how he became a high priest. He was born as a high priest. He got born spiritually into the priesthood. He saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. After the order of Melchizedek. That shows you that something has changed. The Old Testament priesthood was after the order of Aaron. But now he's talking about a new order of the priesthood, the order of Melchizedek. Now who was this Melchizedek? In chapter 7, in verse 1, it speaks of Melchizedek, who was a king of Salem and also a priest of the Most High God. He was a king and a priest. And it's all pointing towards a type of what Jesus would become. When the Old Testament came into being and they set up the law and the priesthood, it was after the order of Aaron. And men could only be a priest. They couldn't be a priest and a king. There were kings, there were priests, but they weren't both. Because the order had changed, the order of Aaron. But now we see that there's a new order, the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is now a priest after this order of Melchizedek. You see, the Old Testament had fault and it had to be replaced. It says in Hebrews 8, 7, If that first covenant had been faultless, then should have no place been sought for the second. There should have been no reason for it. But it had fault, so there needed to be another covenant. It was made between God and a man who couldn't keep it. But now the new covenant is made between God and the man, Christ Jesus. It's a perfect covenant who does keep it. God wants us to realize that there is a new covenant that has come forth in these days. It was prophesied in the Old Testament. Jeremiah chapter 31, the Jews should have understood that the new covenant was coming if they would have paid attention to what the prophets had said. Jeremiah 31, 31 and following, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. They'd already been told this. They should have known what was coming. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I'll put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and they will be their God, be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I'll forgive their iniquity, and I'll remember their sin no more. The new covenant they should have been looking for this new covenant, seeing what Jesus was bringing forth was the fulfillment of it. In Hebrews, when it speaks of this new ministry that Jesus has, as we saw in Hebrews 8, 6, as the mediator of a better covenant established on better promises, seeing the, play of the fact that there needed to be a second one because the first one had fault, he says, for finding fault with them, in verse 8, he said, behold, the days come. Saith the Lord, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. This is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws in their mind, and I'll write them in their hearts. That's what God does. He takes his word, and he writes it in our mind, and he writes it in our heart. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. The covenant, same thing that was prophesied by Jeremiah, say, here it is, the fulfillment of it. They shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. And he adds, he says, I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. That's what happens in the New Testament. In that he saith, the new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. We are not under the Old Testament any longer. We are now under the New Testament. Now, how could Jesus become a priest then? In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14, it addresses this where it says, For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. He was of the tribe of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Nobody from Judah could be a priest in the Old Testament. They could only be a priest if they were of the tribe of Levi. Well, there's been a change, of course. It says in Hebrews 7.11, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, 
What further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Otherwise, the, why would its order have to be changed? Well, under the Levitical law, nobody could be perfect because none of them had a brand new spirit. None of them were born again. None of them were, were changed on the inside of them. So they never could come to the place of perfection. And there had to be another order, the order of Melchizedek, that was going to bring forth the real high priest, Jesus, who was going to accomplish this great work of redemption. We see in verse 12 it says, For the priesthood being changed, not only was the covenant changed, but the priesthood had to be changed. There's made of necessity a change also of the law. We're not in this, we're under a different priesthood. We're also under a different law. That's why we're not under the Old Testament law any longer, which includes the Ten Commandments. We're not under them anymore. We're under the New Testament now. And the New Testament has law as well, as you will see. You see, back in Exodus, there was a prophecy that was given. Exodus chapter 19, over in verse 5, after they came out of Egypt, God gave this prophecy to them. Remember, this is in the Old Testament era. He said, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the earth, all the, for, above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. He's speaking to all of the children of Israel. And a holy nation. These are the words that thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. It wasn't just spoke to one tribe, the tribe of Levi. He's speaking it to the whole group. Well, could they all become priests, a kingdom of priests in the Old Testament? No. They couldn't, be, they couldn't even be kings and priests at the same time. Well, this prophecy was fulfilled in the New Testament because it says over here in Revelation chapter 1, speaking of what Jesus accomplished for us in verse 5, from Jesus Christ, who's the faithful witness, the first begotten or firstborn, again this means, Jesus was born from the dead first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And what has he made us? He's made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We are now kings and priests. That means we're under the Melchizedek priesthood, where they had a king and a priest. God has brought a change. There's been a change in the priesthood. Now, the priesthood is twofold that we've come into. 1 Peter chapter 2 over in verse 5 says, You also as lively stones or build up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. We're a holy priesthood, offering up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. We are also a royal priesthood. Verse 9 says you're a chosen generation. A royal priesthood, that's a ruling, reigning priesthood a holy nation, a peculiar people. Remember he said, you're going to be a holy nation, you're going to be a peculiar people. That's exactly what he has, Jesus has brought. And you would show forth the praise of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We have now come into the priesthood and the kingship under the order of Melchizedek, as you and I are kings and priests unto God. As we mentioned, the law has changed, as we saw again back in Hebrews 7, Verse 12, the priesthood being changed, there's made a necessity of change also of the law. That's important to realize. There is not a doing away of law in the New Testament. There's a change of the law. We're not under the Old Testament law any longer, but we are under law. And what law is that? That is the law of Christ in the New Testament. Galatians 6, verse 2 says, when you bear one another's burdens, you so fulfill the law of Christ. There is a law that you now, you and I walk after. This law is a law that's going to bring forth liberty. In fact, it calls it in James 1.25, whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty. It's the perfect law of liberty that will bring total liberty and victory in your life. This is what you and I walk by. And also, this is what you and I need to speak and do because we're going to be judged by it. James 2.12 says, So speak ye and so do ye, to do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. This law will bring victory in our life. At the same time, there is a penalty if you don't obey. We're going to be judged according to this law of liberty. So the way, into the way now to 
come into the priesthood. We see a brand new priesthood's come. But there's another thing we have to address. The way that you get into the priesthood has also changed. How did they get in the priesthood in the Old Testament? You had to be born into the priesthood. How were you born in the priesthood? If you were of the tribe of Levi, then you were now in the priesthood. So you had to be physically born to come into it. Well, how do you get into the priesthood now in the New Testament? You still have to be born, but it's not anything to do with physical birth. It's spiritual birth. When you are born spiritually, born again, you come into the spiritual priesthood, and you come into the place of being king and a priest unto God. See, that's what happened to Jesus. How did Jesus become a priest? Remember, he wasn't of the tribe of Levi. He was the tribe of Judah. He was born into it spiritually. There is a new way of coming into the priesthood today. It is by spiritual birth, being born again. In Hebrews chapter 1, or again, where we saw in verse 5, this is why it says this, I'll be, this day have I begotten thee. He got born, spiritually born, coming into the priesthood. And we see that he's the first begotten or the firstborn that came in. Jesus was the firstborn of all creation. We even see this declared over in Colossians chapter 1, down in verse 15. And here it says, Who's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature or creation. The same word used over in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, when it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, a new creation. Old things are passed away, all things have become new. We're brand new on the inside of us. You get a brand new spirit. You are a new creation. Jesus was the firstborn, and when you and I get born again, we come into that same position. We see over in verse 18, speaking of Jesus, he's the head of the body. The body is the body of Christ. We're all members of it when we're born again. But the body of the church who's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And what kind of a church is it that we have today? There's only one church that he recognizes. Only one church. That one church we see in Hebrews in chapter 12, over in verse 22 and 23. This is the only church he recognizes. It says, you're coming to Mount Zion, under the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, that's in heaven, to innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. So not only did being born from the dead bring him into the priesthood, that brings you into the church, that brings you into relationship with God, brings you a new spirit. That's why everybody must be born again. If you're not born again, you don't have a relationship with God yet. God wants you to receive him and be born again. The church of the firstborn, which is written in heaven, to God the judge of all, the spirits of just men made perfect. You and I are now a part of this. And when it speaks of Jesus, <coughs> declares now in Hebrews chapter 7, over here in verse 8, it speaks also of what Jesus does. He's now the high priest. He's also receiving the tithes. It says here at Hebrews 7, 8, Here men that die receive tithes. But there he receiveth them, <coughs> of whom it's witness <coughs> that he liveth. Now who's it's witness that he liveth? Jesus, who's been raised from the dead, the firstborn from the dead. And what does he do? He's receiving the tithes in heaven when we bring them unto him in his high priestly ministry. We see the ministry of Jesus, and remember after he was born from the dead was when he then became the high priest. And what was the first thing that he did? In John chapter 20, we see down here in verse 17, he appeared to Mary here. He was, this is before he went to heaven. He was going to take his blood up on the mercy seat in heaven, pour it out there. John 17, 20 verse 17, he said to her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brother and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father, and to my God and to your God. What did he do? He went up to heaven. And what happened when he went up to heaven? We see this in Hebrews chapter 9, over in verse 11 and 12. It says, Christ being come a high priest, he's the high priest now, of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, that's what they brought in the Old Testament, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, 
having obtained eternal redemption for us. He came to the, in the very presence of God. We see down in verse 24, it says, Christ is not entered in the holy places made with hands, not on the, on the earth. No, he's, he came into the real one in heaven, which are the figures of the true. But into heaven itself, Jesus went up to heaven, now to appear in the presence of God for us, for all of us, in order to have his blood put on the mercy seat, having accomplished eternal redemption and the ratification of the new covenant. And his blood still is there, and it speaks of mercy, better things than that of Abel's, which called for judgment. And that blood of Jesus is ready to wash away any sins that you ever commit. Not, nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entered in the holy place year after, every year with the blood of others. That's what they had to do in the Old Testament, year after year after year. Nope. Not anymore, for then must he have often have suffered since the foundation of the world, be doing this over and over. But now once, one time, once and for all, in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jesus accomplished this in the high priestly ministry that he entered into. Now, we must realize that in this high priestly ministry, he now is the head of the church, and he is carrying out his responsibility of ministering for us. Hebrews 2, 17 says, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, remember he had like sinful flesh, and he's still the man, Christ Jesus, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. He is merciful. He is faithful. He performs his word, and he is full of mercy, grace, mercy, and peace, are in the New Testament for you and for me. Regarding our sins, Jesus knows everything that you've been through or everything that you'll ever go through. Because Hebrews 4.15, we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He was tempted in every point, and yet he did not sin. So he knows everything that you ever have gone through or everything that you will go through. If you always look to what he tells you to do, you can always triumph over it, because now sin has no dominion over you in the New Testament. Now we see him as seated at the right hand of the Father, and he has a ministry. We see we go back to Hebrews 8, 6, and it mentions that he has a ministry as mediator. Hebrews 8, 6, he's now obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he's the mediator of a better covenant. He's the one that intervenes between two. The mediator of this better covenant. And what is he going to do? It's the mediator of between God and man in order to bring man to the place of reconciliation unto God. That's exactly what he's accomplished for us. We see over in Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Jesus, by he is the way to reconciliation, and he reconciled all things unto himself. We see that what was happening was God was in Christ, accomplishing the work of reconciling the world to himself. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. God was in Christ. What's he doing? Reconciling the world unto himself. Was he pointing out everybody's sins and charging their sins against them? No. He's not imputing their trespasses against them because the gospel is good news. He wants you to come to him just as you are. He's committed unto us the word of reconciliation. That's why you and I, we need to take the word of God, the good news, and preach the good news to others. Now then, you are ambassadors for Christ. As though God beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. God's made you an ambassador for Christ, and you're to go forth and take the word of God and to share it with them so that they can be reconciled unto the Lord through the mediatorial ministry of Jesus Christ. We see over in John, chapter 14, verse 6, the statement that Jesus makes. He says this, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's the only way. You can't get to the Father except through Jesus Christ. There is no other way. 
these ones that teach out there, oh, there's many ways to God, it's a lie. There's only one way, because there's only one way, per one person who paid the price for man's sin and accomplished the redemption, it is Jesus. He is the only way. No man can come unto the Father to be reconciled to Him except through Jesus Christ. We see over in Acts, the only way for you to be saved is to call upon the name of the Lord. Acts 4.12 says, There is neither salvation in any other. Nobody else can save you. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. But calling upon Jesus and receiving Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. He's the mediator. And we see that he's the mediator between God and man to bring him into relationship with him. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. When you receive Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, then you'll come into relationship with God as you get a brand new spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ. He's the mediator. He also has another area of ministry. He is now the intercessor. We see in Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8 over in verse 34, who is the condemneth? It is Christ that dieth, yea, rather, that's risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, that's where he's seated, who also makes intercession for us. That means he will pray for us. He makes intercession for us. Is this intercession automatic? No. It depends on whether you put him into operation or not. We see in Hebrews chapter 7, in verse 25, it says, whereby he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, by Jesus, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for him. He's ready to make intercession, but it's not automatic. If he was praying for you, you should have, all your problems should be gone and you should have no more problems. No, you have to pray to put him in operation. As you pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, then he is your intercessor that takes that which you pray and presents it before the Father. He is the one who ever lives to make intercession for us. He is the intercessor. That's why prayer is now to the Father in the name of Jesus, going through the high priestly ministry of Jesus, who takes that and presents it, presents it before the Father. Jesus also has the ministry of being our heavenly attorney. The New Testament calls us the advocate. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, my little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. See, in the New Testament, sin has no dominion over us. We don't have to walk in sin any longer. We can conquer sin. But if any man sin, we can sin. And if we do sin, we have an advocate, or this is one who call, comes along aside like a counsel for defense, like a legal assistant, he's like a heavenly attorney. Jesus is like our heavenly attorney. If we confess our sins, we have this advocate, we, with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, that when you confess your sins, He will wash them away. He's the propitiation for our sins, not only for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He paid the price for all sin. And so you and I, now, because of the blood of Jesus Christ that is on the mercy seat in heaven, when you confess your sins, they're going to be washed away in the blood of Jesus Christ. It says in 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is our advocate. He is the one who will wash away our sins, our heavenly attorney, against the devil's accusations against us. That's why if you have sin in your life, be sure you confess the sin and receive forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness and repent and turn away from it. Now the blood of Jesus Christ does continually have an effect upon us. If we walk in the ways of the Word, it keeps us cleansed. 1 John 1, 7 says, If we walk in the light, that's the Word, as He is in the light, we have, and what's the way of the light? It's anything that's in line with the Word of God. Anything that's not would be the way of darkness, which is sin. We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. When it speaks of it cleansing us from all sin, this word is in the present tense in the Greek, ongoing action, continuous ongoing action, the present tense means. This means the blood will continually keep you cleansed from all sin because it's applied to you because you walk in the light of the Word of God. And you, it keeps you in that relationship with the Lord. 
So He is our heavenly advocate. And when our sins are washed away, we must realize we should have no more conscience of sins. If the devil brings up sins of the past, that's the devil bringing that up. Don't listen to him. If you've confessed your sins and received forgiveness and repented, God doesn't remember them anymore, as you'll see in a moment. Look what it says in Hebrews 10. So Hebrews 10 says, Then they would have not have ceased to be offered, because the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. Well, under the law in the Old Testament, it couldn't do that. It couldn't do that. That's why it's said back here how the law was a shadow of good things to come, not the very image of the things. You can never with those sacrifices they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. You can never bring it to perfection. But now, in the New Testament, we can because the blood of Jesus Christ will wash away our sins. If it, in the Old Testament, if it would have purged them, they would have had no more conscience of sins, meaning if your sins are washed away, why should you have a, why should you have a consciousness of sins any longer? You shouldn't. That means all guilt and condemnation. It's not coming from God. It's coming from the devil. Do not ever receive guilt or condemnation. Now, the Holy Spirit will convict you of sin if you're abiding in sin or committing sin to bring you to repentance. But after you've confessed your sins, there should be no guilt or condemnation any longer. Hebrews 8.12 says, I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. If God remembers them no more, then why are they coming up to you? Not God bringing it to you, it's the devil bringing it to you, trying to deceive you, trying to make you think that you're not forgiven, get you to reflect on the negative things of the past. He's a master at bringing up the past and replaying things over and over and over of the things that you've done or what's happened to you. Don't give place to that. And he also likes to bring guilt and condemnation upon you. No, we're not going to receive that because we have, have the advocate who is, who is our heavenly attorney who's washed away our sins. Another thing that we see that Jesus does, he is the surety or the guarantor that the promises of God and the Word of God will be performed in your life. In Hebrews 7.22, it says so much, by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better covenant, a better testament. A surety is one who's a guarantor, one who guarantees that something is going to come to pass. You know, we have our insurance companies, some of them are called surety companies. They're guaranteeing that they're going to pay such and such if you meet the conditions for that particular claim. Well, Jesus is the guarantor of the better covenant. In other words, he personally guarantees that he is going to perform his word and his promises for you in your life. We see that God is a performer of his word. Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah 55, verse 11. He says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void. No, his word is going to accomplish something. It accomplishes that which I please, and it prospers in the thing whereto I send it. Because God's going to watch over his word, and he's going to perform it in your life. In fact, we see that statement over here in Jeremiah 1, verse 12. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. God hastens. The word hasten means to watch over. He watches over his word to perform it in your life. If you do what he says, he will perform the word and bring the promises of God to pass for you. You've got to know that God's word is important. He pays attention, pays attention to his word. When you speak his word, you pray his word, you do his word, he takes notice. Matthew 24, 35 says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. God takes heed to his word. That's why when you act on the word, you pray the word, you do the word, he is going to bring that to pass as you act upon it. Another thing we see about the ministry of Jesus, it's over in 1 Peter chapter 5, over in verse 4. It speaks of the shepherd ministry of Jesus Christ. He is the great shepherd of the sheep. Verse 4 says, When the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. A shepherd of the sheep. We're going to get a crown of glory when he appears, if we have been walking and been faithful unto him. Now what does a shepherd do? A shepherd, he herds the flock, he tends the flock, 
He guides them. He watches over them. He protects the flock. He does all these things. That's exactly what he'll do for us. He's the great shepherd. You and I are sheep. We are the sheep who follow him as we walk in the ways of the Lord. We see over in John chapter 10, it speaks of Jesus as the good shepherd. John 10 verse 14, he said, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Remember, if you're really a sheep, you're following him, doing what his word says. Those that don't follow him, they're not a sheep. They're like a goat. They just wander off doing their own thing. If you don't do the word of God, you're not a sheep. You're a goat. If you are a doer of the word and you're walking closely with him, you are a sheep. The sheep are always right on the heels of the shepherd. You've seen the sheep out in the fields with the shepherd. They're right on their heels, so they're close to him. That's what God wants for you. I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep, the ones that follow him, and I'm known of mine. Not only does he know you, but you'll know him. You'll be known. You'll know the Lord. He goes on and says, As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and shall be one fold and one shepherd. Of course, that's in the New Testament era. But now, you and I hear the voice of the Lord. We become the sheep of the Lord. And the shepherd is Jesus now, the great shepherd, the head over the church. We see in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 over in verse 25. It says, You were as sheep going astray, walking in the ways of sin, but are now returned unto the shepherd and the bishop of your souls. The shepherd and the watching over and the bishop or the overseer of your souls. God is watching over you. If you will walk in his ways, he will watch over you. He will protect you. He will guard you. He will minister to the needs in your life. He will show you the way to walk in. He will always lead you and guide you in the right path if you will listen unto him and walk in his ways. He's the great shepherd. He's also the head of the body. Colossians chapter 1, as we saw earlier, verse 18. He is the head of the body. You and I are members of the body of Christ if you're born again. Jesus the head. You and I have a part in the body of Christ. And what's that? That's the church. All those that are born from the dead. And we see now in Ephesians, it speaks also of this, Ephesians chapter 1, over in verse 22. It says, He's put all things under His feet and gave Him to be the head over all things to the church. Jesus is the head over the church. And every one of us are important. Don't think for a minute that you're not important. The devil tries to make you think that you're not important. He's lying to you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we see down here where he says in verse 12, As the body is one, as many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. If you're born again, you're all a part of the body of Christ. The body's not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? No, of course not. It's a part of the body. If the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? No, everybody is a part of the body. Every one of us are different. But we're all still members of that same body if you've been born again. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? Otherwise, you're not to be like somebody else. You're to be what God has called you to be. Every part is important. He wants you to understand what he calls you to do in the ministry that you have and to carry it out. You're important for the Lord. Now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased him. That's why you seek the Lord to find out what God has for you to do as a member of the body of Christ. If they were all one member, where were the body? But now there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Don't think that I don't need, you don't need other members of the body. That's a lie. You, everybody needs them. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Now who's the head of the body? Jesus. The head, Jesus, doesn't say to the feet, I don't have need of you. See, he needs you and me. He wants you to walk in his ways and to follow him so he can accomplish the things that he wants in your life. He wants to do a great work in your life. And he wants you to be a servant of the Lord and carry out the ministry 
that he's called you unto. Every one of us are important as in the members of the body of Christ. In fact, the great shepherd of the sheep, it talks about over in Ephesians chapter 4, we see how he's given gifts unto men. It says he speaks, he gave gifts unto men in verse 8. And he comes to verse 11 and he says he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. What's their purpose? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. God wants to bring us all into perfection through the Word of God, through these different ministries. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Every one of us has the work of the ministry and every one of us is to be involved in bringing edification to the body of Christ. And this is so until we all come, God wants all of us to come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge. Knowledge means precise, correct knowledge. Precise, correct knowledge. That's why you need to study the Word. You've got to learn the Word. You've got to know what the Bible says exactly. Precise, correct knowledge of the Son of God. Unto the perfect man, unto the measure of the fullness of Christ, stature of the fullness of Christ. The perfect man is going to arise in these last days because there's a remnant. The body of Christ is going to arise that are going to take their place and walk in the ways of the Lord. That's why, of course, we've got to be in line with the Word. They're going to, the body of Christ is going to be in unity on the faith and on the exact, precise, correct knowledge of God. Verse 14 says, We henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. No, we're, we're not going to have all these different doctrines. We're going to have the true doctrine through the Word. We speak the truth in love. We might grow up in Him in all things, which is the head even Christ, from whom the whole body, you and I are part of the body, He's the great shepherd over the body. Fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, you're important. According to the effectual working and the measure of every part, makes increase of the body under the edifying of itself in love. God wants every one of us to take our rightful place. And this great shepherd, the great shepherd of the sheep, we see in Psalms 23 a picture of what he will do in your life. Psalms 23, where it says, The Lord is my shepherd. This is one that is prophetic for the New Testament era. I shall not want. This means to lack. When the Lord's your shepherd leading and guiding you, you won't lack in anything. He'll meet all of your needs. In fact, it says, He makes me to lie down in green pastures. That's prosperity. That's prosperity. Having your needs met, being ministered to all the needs in your life. He leads me beside the still waters. That's peace. Not turbulence in your life, not all this turmoil and everything. God wants you to be beside the still waters, having peace in your life. That's what He'll lead you to. He restores my soul. He comes to restore our soul, areas where we've been hurt, wounded, damaged in our emotions. He comes to restore our mind. He comes to restore us in the soulless realm, our will, so we make the choices and choose the way of the Lord, think on the things He wants. God wants to restore your soul, to heal you, to deliver you, and set you free. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. God's always going to lead you in the way of righteousness. He'll never lead you in the way of sin. He always will point you to the Word and show you what to do in everything. That's why He wants you to get the Word in you, think on the Word, speak the Word, do the Word, walk in the ways of the Word of God at all times in your life. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Where's that? That's in this earth, because it's all around. We're in a place where it's been dominated by the enemy, the God of this world, and all the effects of sin and all the destructive things that go on. He says, I will fear no evil. Thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. God doesn't want you afraid of any evil. Don't be afraid of things that are coming on the earth. As we go down these last days, you're going to see things get worse and worse. Do not be afraid of anything. He says, Thou art with me, the Lord's with us. And what comforts us? Two things, the rod, which is a type of Jesus. Remember, he was the rod that was cast down, that budded, that swallowed up the other serpents. And thy staff, which is a type of the Holy Spirit. Jesus and the Holy Spirit are the two comforters. Jesus is the Word. So the Word and the Holy Spirit, they are working in your life to comfort you and to lead you and guide you. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Remember, you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. The demons are all over the place. 
Angels are also all over the place, but the demons are all out there trying to lead people in the paths of destruction. In the presence of all these enemies, there'll be a table of blessing. God will bring his blessings upon you. There'll be showers of blessings in the midst of all these enemies all around if you'll walk in the ways of the Lord. Thou anointest my head with oil. The anointing of God will be upon you as you walk in his ways. The anointing of God will work to bring forth all the things that he purposes and allowing the Holy Spirit to have his way and accomplish his work in your life and through you. My cup runneth over. That's the blessings. The blessings are going to come. In fact, the blessings will come on you and overtake you. There'll be showers of blessings, it talks about, in Ezekiel, that would come upon us. My cup runneth over. And he says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That's what God has for us. He wants goodness and mercy following after you, not all this negative stuff going on. Now, if you walk in sin, you're going to have all kinds of demons are going to follow after you. You're going to see all kinds of destructive things. No, we need to be following the way of the Lord. You follow him and you make him your shepherd. Goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. And you're going to dwell in the house of the Lord. Now, if you get out of his presence, you start walking in other ways, look out. <laughs> you're out there on sin land. The devil's going to be coming after you. And he will have a right to get to you because you open up the door. We must let him be the shepherd in our life. Hebrews chapter 13, over in verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, that's Jesus, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, you and I have come into a covenant relationship, blood covenant, what's he going to do? He will make you perfect in every good work to do His will. And He'll be working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight. See, if He's your, the great shepherd over the sheep and you're following Him, you're going to do what He says. He says, He'll make you perfect in every good work. And you will do His will, and He will be working in you the things that are well-pleasing in the sight of the Lord. That's why you've got to give your heart to Him. That's why you've got to yield yourself to Him. That's why you've got to put the Lord first place in your life. If not, you know, you're going to give place to the enemy, and the, Satan will bring all kinds of destructive things, and they will come upon you. You will not be able to get away from them. You're either submitted to God, or you're submitted to the devil. There's no middle ground. And if you think you're running your own life, now that's deception. What you're doing, if you're not walking the way of the Lord, you're actually yielding to the devil. That's why we've got to make him the shepherd over us and be a true sheep following after the Lord. Another thing that we see of the ministry of Jesus in Hebrews 3.1, he is the apostle and the high priest of our confession or profession. Hebrews 3.1 says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. That means, profession mean, is the word homologia, which means to say the same thing. It's translated confession at places in the New Testament. So it's talking about you're what you confess or what you speak with your mouth. And what are we to speak? The Word of God. Why do we speak the Word of God? That releases Him to accomplish the promises of God in our life. So He's the high priest over our confession. The things that you're speaking are important. This is why it tells us in Hebrews 4.14, as you are speaking God's Word to receive a promise or to bring something into manifestation. Hebrews 4.14, Seeing then we have a great high priest that's passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. See, you're holding fast what you're confessing and speaking because what's happening? Jesus is your high priest. What's he doing? He's taking that which you speak and he's going to speak it, pray it before the Father. He's going to bring it before the Father. That's because everything you're doing is going to go through the high priestly ministry of Jesus. We even see this shown in Matthew chapter 10 over in verse 32. He says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. How would we confess Jesus before men? Well, he's the Word when we speak the Word. When you're confessing the Word of God, when you're speaking God's Word, putting His Word in operation, then He's going to take that, He's going to confess you before the Father. And the Father then, why? Because that's going to, you're going to be the releasing of the promises of God as you're confessing the word and taking hold of it with your faith. Now, there's another statement, though. Whosoever denies me before men, how would I deny him if I don't do what his word says? 
if I don't carry out the word of God. You'll be denied before God and he's not going to do anything for you because this is a covenant you've come into. You've got to perform the word of the covenant. Whosoever deny me before men, him will I deny before the Father which is in heaven. You don't get an automatic audience with the Father unless you do what the word says and do what is right. Not only does it go that what you speak and confess goes to the Father, but it also, Jesus is going to take that and speak that before the angels. Luke chapter 12, verse 8 says, Also I say unto you, Whosoever shall confess me, or the word, Jesus, before men, him shall the Son of Man confess before the angels of God. The angels are going to hear the things that you're speaking, and they're going to go forth to perform the word. They're God's servants that perform the word. Now the same thing is true, verse 9, though. He that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. Angels are to minister for us. In fact, if we go over and we look at Hebrews 1.14, it speaks about angels, what their purpose is. Are they not all ministering spirits? Angels are ministering spirits. What are they doing? They're sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation. Who's an heir of salvation? You and I are. We are heirs. And Jesus is an heir of all things. We're heirs of all things. All the promises of God belong to us. So, the angels will minister for us, the heirs of salvation. That means they're going to perform the word and bring the word to pass in your life as you do what it says. We even see, it talks about in Psalms 103, about what these angels will do. Psalms 103, verse 20, he says this, Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, Excel is really not a good word here for the translation of it because the word excel is a word, gabor, which means they're strong and mighty. The angels are mighty. They're strong and mighty as Young's brings forth. In strength, the word strength is this word strength or power. It's coact. It refers to a manifested power. So they are mighty and manifesting power. And they're going to manifest power against the demons who have power as well to conquer them, the evil spirits that serve Satan. What do they do? They do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. So when you speak God's word, or you do God's word, the angels are going to hearken to the word of God that you're doing. Or when you speak it, then what does Jesus do? He takes that word, confesses it before the angels, and what are they going to do? They're going to hearken to it. They're going to carry it out. See, the angels are listening to what you're speaking. Because what you're speaking, Jesus is going to take that and confess it before them, which directs them to go forth and to do things. See, you can't make angels do something. Jesus is the one who directs the angels. You must speak the word of God, and Jesus takes it and then confesses it before the angels that go forth and carry it out. Another way that you put angels in operation is also through praying God's word. You can pray and see the angels of God come into manifestation to deal with whatever situation. Most Christians do not put their angels in operation for them, which is a mistake. Matthew 26, this is when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember when all the enemies always tried to come against him? He always could always evade anything. He always walked free. They never could get to him whatsoever. Remember at Nazareth, they wanted to push him off the brow of the hill? He walked right through the midst of them. Why? Because Jesus had dominion and he would bind those spirits with authority and he also would pray to the Father for the Father to send forth angels that would minister to him and deliver him from what the demons were trying to do through the people. Well, this is when he's in the garden. And here when he gives himself into the hands of Judas. Remember, he was giving himself. They didn't take him. He laid down his life and gave himself. It was the hour and power of darkness. Well, this is what he says. This is his comment. He said, Thinkest thou that I cannot pray, now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? Otherwise, I can pray for the angels, the Father to send me angels, and they'll come and deal with the situation. Legions. A legion was 6,826 men. Well, you take that times twelve, we're talking about, what, 8,000 angels or so coming on the scene, something like that. Some tremendous amount of angels. All those angels, well, 80,000 angels, I mean, would have come on the scene. 80,000 angels, he must have known, well, this is, this is what will take care of all the demons that were working against him. 
the angels will come and they will come and they will fight for you. They will fight against your enemies. They will protect you. The Bible talks about how the angels will have charge over us to keep us in all of our ways. The Bible declares that the angels will encamp round about us and they will protect us and deliver us from attacks from the enemy. God wants us to put the angels in operation. See, this, these is the, this is the ministry of Jesus. And it doesn't automatically get put in operation. You have, to put, you have to pray to see the angels come into operation. They don't automatically do things for you just because you're born again. And also, you've got to keep praying. When you keep praying and you're confessing the word or speaking the word and, and Jesus has confessed that before the angels, don't think that the angels aren't doing something because you don't see something happen immediately. This is the case in Daniel chapter 10 when he was fasting and praying for three weeks. And he was praying for three weeks for revelation. And this angel was on the way to bring him the revelation of understanding. The angel shows up and says this to him in Daniel 10, 12. Then said he to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. The first day. Well, this is 21 days later. The angels move in the flash of light instantly. How come it took the angel 21 days to get through? Because there was resistance from the enemies, the evil principality. He said, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for one and 20 days. That shows you that demons can withstand angels and hinder the things of God from coming to pass until the power of God prevails against them. Angels have power. It's the same thing we cast out demons. That's why when you cast out demons, a lot of times they resist for a while before they come out because they do have power and will try to resist. That's why you and I keep on casting out or we keep on praying. We keep on putting the power of God in operation. The angels are working. Don't stop. Don't ever give up. You keep on praying. You keep on speaking the word. You keep praying the word knowing that the angels are going in operation and they will bring forth victory. Praise God. That's why we got to hold fast our confession. What do we see? We've seen tonight the fact that Jesus has a present ministry. This present ministry is because of what he's accomplished. Jesus paid the price, redeemed us, brought us to the place now. Now we can come into the new covenant. He's the firstborn from the dead. You and I get born from the dead. We get born again. We come into covenant relationship with him. Once we come into covenant relationship with him, we're now in that position in the new covenant. And we're now under a better covenant with better promises. There are now the law of the new covenant that you and I walk by as we walk in line with that word. And we see now that you and I are kings and priests. We can rule and reign over the enemies. We now are priests. We have come, can come into the very presence of the Lord. And we also see now that Jesus has the high priestly ministry that he's going to carry it out. He's faithful. He's merciful, as we've seen. He knows every situation you've been through. He's already been tempted in all points, yet without sin, so he knows everything. Just look, look to him to show you what to do in every situation, and he will lead you and guide you. We see also that Jesus is up there receiving the tithes. When you bring your tithes, he takes them and receives them and sets them before the Father as we worship him so that the blessings will be poured out upon us. He is the mediator of the covenant between man, God, and man in order to bring those into relationship. That's why when you preach the gospel, you preach Jesus to them. If they will receive Jesus, they'll get born again. He's the intercessor. He's ready to intercede, but you've got to pray. It's not going to happen unless you pray. You pray, he prays. Whatever you pray is coming through Jesus, the high priest. That's why you pray directly to the Father in the name of Jesus, it's coming through the high priestly ministry of Jesus who takes that and confesses that before the Father as well as before the angels. We see he's the advocate. So when you sin, don't wallow in your sin. Don't continue in your sin. Don't get under guilt and condemnation. Don't continue in that. Conf <clears throat> confess your sins and receive forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness and turn away from it. And what will happen? Jesus will forgive you of your sins, cleanse you from it. And if you'll continually walk in his ways, of his, in the light, in his word, then the blood of Jesus will continually keep you cleansed from all sin. He is the way, the truth, the light. He's your intercessor. He's the advocate. 
He's also the surety, the guarantor, that what he's promised, he'll perform. Every promise belongs to you. All the promises are ours. We've already been blessed with spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. He's the guarantee, the guarantor of performing the word, and he watches over his word to perform it. He's also the shepherd of the sheep. He's going to lead you and guide you. You're important to God. He wants you to be close to him so you can hear his voice. As you walk in the ways of the word, you'll be close to him. He's going to lead you, guide you, protect you. He'll watch over you. He'll tend over you. He'll do all the things that we see, bring, meet all your needs so you don't lack, bring you to the green pastures, restore your soul, always lead you in the paths of righteousness. He's the one who'll be there. He comforts you, ministers to you, pours out his blessings upon you. He'll protect you from all the enemies. There'll be a table of blessing in the midst of all these enemies all around. Goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life if he's your, you're a sheep and he is the shepherd and you're following and obedient be unto him. He's also the apostle and the great high priest of our confession. You speak his word, you pray his word, he's taking that and he's doing something with it. Don't ever think that your prayers are in vain unless you're not praying accurately. You do have to pray accurately, remember. You need to pray to the Father in the name of Jesus and pray the word, not the problem, and take hold of that problem and speak those promises into being. He performs that word and brings it to pass in your life. What a great ministry that Jesus has. And he is carrying all this out and he will perform it for you and me. So don't think he's sitting up there doing nothing. No, he's very active, performing his word. He's looking for you and I to do what the word says. So we put his ministry in operation. Are you putting his ministry in operation? Is he operating as an intercessor for you? If you pray, he is. If you don't pray, he's not doing anything. Have you confessed your sins? So he's the advocate. So, you know, he's washing away your sins. And are you walking in the light? Also, is he the one who is the surety? Is he performing the word, watching over the word, guaranteeing this will come to pass, seeing the promises come to pass? Well, if you're not hearing and doing the word and walking in it and speaking it, taking hold of it, he's not doing anything. That's why you and I must be hearers and doers of the word. And he will lead you and guide you as the great shepherd of the sheep. And he's the apostle of our confession. He will bring every promise to pass in our life. And he will confess that before the Father. You and I take hold of it to release it. And he confesses it before the angels who will go forth and perform that in your life. Say this, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the present ministry of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Jesus. You paid the price for my sins. You went to hell and redeemed me, paying that price. You were born from the dead. I am born from the dead. When I received you as personal Lord and Savior, I thank you. I am now a king and a priest in the new priesthood. And I thank you that I'm in a better covenant with better promises and that you are the performer of the word in my life. I thank you that you are the mediator the intercessor, the advocate, the surety, the great shepherd, the apostle and high priest of my confession. You're the merciful, faithful high priest. You're the one that receives my tithes and sets it before the Father and releases the blessings to come forth as is spoken forth. I thank you, Lord, that I am going to put your ministry in operation. Every time I'm hearing and doing your word, I am putting you in operation to perform the promises in my life. Thank you, Lord, for your ministry. I will put you in operation every day because I will do your word, pray your word, speak your word in all areas of my life. Thank you, Lord, for the present ministry of Jesus Christ. It will be put in operation every day of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. What a wonderful thing he's doing. He's carrying it out. He's not just sitting around doing nothing. You're not all alone. He's, he's up there waiting for you to do things. He's with you. He's come to dwell in you, and now he wants you to put him in operation so that he can bring forth all these promises and blessings in your life. Praise God for what Jesus has done. Father, we thank you and praise you for your word. 
We thank you and praise you that you could bring much fruit because we're going to take hold of all that you said. We're going to put this, the ministry of Jesus in operation because we're going to hear and do your word and know the things are going to come to pass. When we pray your word, we're going to know that you take it and confess it as an intercessor before the Father and to see it come to pass. When we speak your word or confess your word or do your word, we know that the angels are going to operation. Father, we thank you because of this revelation. We know everything that you have said in your word is going to come to pass because of the ministry of Jesus Christ as the high priest of this covenant. And Father, we thank you for the performance of your word and all these promises and blessings coming forth and doing all that you have said. Thank you. We will put the present ministry of Jesus in operation all the days of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. You know, when you understand this, you can have absolute faith. You can know what Jesus is going to do in every situation. You pray the word, you just have that mental consciousness, you understand. Hey, he took it and he's confessing before the Father, confessed before the angels, and they're going forth to perform it. They're doing it. Yeah. Don't just wonder, I wonder if anything got anywhere. Well, that's, we just don't understand. If we get this understanding, then we know what God will do. And he's performing it. See, when you operate by faith, that's what brings the victory Amen. in your life. Praise God. If you need prayer, I invite you to come forward like to pray for you in any areas of need in your life. Be a doer of the word. God bless. Have a great week as you are doing the word of God. You're dismissed. Need prayer? Come forward.